How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here. Figure 4 Daily, September 4, 2020. Figure4online.com slash wrestlingobserver.com. Our weekly Lance Storm Show. Lance is joining us here. Obviously on the podcast, as always. Also, video.f4wonline.com. And my God, Lance, where are you today? Is there anything more wrestling than where I am now? Holy smokes. I see a menu... Anyone who's ever been in the wrestling business can tell where I am. The hard part was finding an empty one, so I didn't have people that in the is, background. Well, you know, so many places are shut down now, Lance, that, I mean, it would have been harder a year ago. Yeah, there was two people way in the back corner. I told them to stay to the side and stay quiet, but other than that, it's it's good. Well, listen, everybody, this is a free show here today, so for all of you listening for the first time, just a, a very, very quick plug. If you love this show with Lance, we do it every single week here on the on WrestlingObserver.com. And if you head to WrestlingObserver.com and subscribe, you not only will get this Lance show every week, but every audio show that we do. We do anywhere from 15 to 20 new shows a week. These are the shows I do, the shows Dave, Lance here, Filthy Tom Lawler. We do the Brian and Vinny show. I mean, there's a thousand shows. Semper Vivi will get mad if I don't plug his show. <laughs> I was waiting for that one. I was almost not gonna, but anyway, there's 15 to 20 brand new shows every single week for subscribers. So when you sign up, it's not like, oh, you get your one show a week for your... No, 15 to 20 brand new shows a week, and and subscribers get our full archive. So every show that we have done dating back to 2005, meaning all of the shows that Lance did before he went to WWE, all the shows he's done since coming back from WWE. We've interviewed everybody under the sun. All of these shows are available in our archives. If, for example, you've been watching some ECW, WWE, ECW pay-per-view from 2006, you want to know what we thought about it, you can go to the archives, and we've got a show about it. Because every show we've done dating back to 2005 is available. Subscribers at WrestlingObserver.com. WrestlingObserver.com subscribers also get The Observer every week. There's 35, 40,000 words in every single Observer. You see all this news all over the internet. You may as well just read The Observer. And we've got thousands of Observers dating back, believe it or not, to 1991. So any story that you've been wondering about... You can go back and read The Observer from that week and get every detail that you need. Also, Lance and I are up at video.f4wonline.com. It is a, a video subscription service. It's part of YouTube. So all of our shows, every show that we do except The Dave Show, is in video form at video.f4wonline.com. So you can either listen to the audio through WrestlingObserver.com. If you love the video, video.f4wonline.com. million ways to enjoy these programs. So if you like it, and you want more, it's pretty easy. You can sign up and get everything you want, archives, the whole nine yards. We have more in our archives. This is no joke. We have more in our archives than the WWE Network has in their archives. So you'll never run out of audio. If you have a commute still, if you go to the gym, if it's open, all these things I used to say that you could do that you can't do anymore, but if you do them, and when we can do them again, and you want audio... It's a place to go, WrestlingObserver.com. So enough plugs, Lance. There we go. Let's give them some damn content. Yeah, we got to talk about this here today. This from WrestlingObserver.com, first reported by Wrestling Inc., although I actually heard about it, like, very early today. So what happened is Vince McMahon sent a letter to Talents on Thursday saying they have 30 days to stop engaging with third parties or else face fines, suspensions, and even termination at WWE's discretion. It is unclear, it says here, what third parties means. Several wrestlers operate Twitch and YouTube channels. I was told when I heard about it today that we're talking TikTok and uh, Twitch and I forget the other ones I heard. Those were the two big ones that I heard. TikTok, because I know that I won't mention any names, but there's plenty of the WWE women that are on TikTok. And there are several that are that are furious about this. And this affects everybody in a lot of different ways because, you know, the women are not getting rich. I mean, they make a lot better money now than they did, like, in the Attitude Era or even a decade ago. But, you know, uh, uh, Lana, for example, like, I don't know what she makes, but she's rarely on television. She's now doing something with Natty. But, I mean, for a long time, she wasn't even on TV. And so this was a way for... The women turn extra money. I don't know about Instagram and how that's going to be affected if you're like an influencer or whatever. But, you know, a lot of these places, it was a place for them to go to make extra money. And now, boom, 
the hammer is being laid down. And some of these individuals have, have invested a lot of money in computers and whatever to do all of this. And now they wake up and they get this, I think it was a phone call, and they're basically told, no more. Uh, the exact letter said, some of you are engaged with outside third parties using your name and likeness in ways that are detrimental to our company. It is imperative these activities be terminated within the next 30 days. Continued violations will result in fines, suspensions, or termination at WWE's discretion. Lance, you were just there. What do you make of this? Well, part of it doesn't surprise me. Uh, I was dumbfounded when I saw how many contracted talent still had Pro Wrestling Tees merch stores selling merch under, you know, the names that they were using in WWE. And so I was dumbfounded. I'm like, are they allowed to do this? And I was told that it's just, you know, no one seems to care. No one says anything. So people keep doing it. So in that regard, I understand if that's what they're shutting down. Because, again, I know my contracts always said that, you know, they have the exclusive rights to merchandise my character. So if if Lance Storm was in WWE under contract, I would expect I should have to shut down my Pro Wrestling Tees store for Lance Storm merch. I'm not under contract, so you can go to Pro Wrestling Tees. There's actually a sale right now, and you can save 20% on my Lance Storm and Storm Wrestling Academy t-shirts. But the TikTok thing, and like the one I'm most, cons I don't know if concern's the right word, but the one I'm more interested in is like, does Xavier Woods have to shut down Up, Up, Down, Down? Like, he does that under Austin Creed. It has nothing to do with wrestling. I'm not sure how an independent contractor as a pro wrestler isn't allowed to do a video game Twitch or YouTube, whatever the hell it is, I don't even know, uh, YouTube show about something non-wrestling related. I, th I think... It could open up a can of worms with people deciding that they want to push the independent contractor status. But I can certainly see where if you are, again, Lana, I don't know. Um, I've seen Lana's Instagram and I've seen some TikToks of her dancing. But I don't know if it's done as Lana or whether it's done as whatever the hell her real name is. But if it is done under her... WWE owned and created name, I could certainly see where Vince has the right to say you don't get to do TikTok videos and Instagram stuff with your energy drinks and get your own endorsement deals. Well, let but me jump in right now because I did hear that one person said that what WWE was basically telling them was, we own your character name and also your real name. It's like, no, you don't. <laughs> you don't own their real names. That's... That's why you give them fake names, because you want to be able to market it, and you don't want to be able to have them take that elsewhere when they leave WWE. That's why we have a Brian Danielson, or a, a Daniel Bryan and not a Brian Danielson. You don't own their names. And I want to say about the independent contractor, just very quickly, I mean, that's all I heard all day was, how can you do this to an independent contractor? There's no way this is legal, blah, blah, blah. Did I heard this for years? I'm not saying it is legal. I'm not saying anything, except it's 2020. This has been challenged before, and they're still getting away with all of this. So the idea that it's obviously not legal, it's obvious, I was here, obviously, dude, it ain't obvious. If it were obviously not legal, I mean, this would have been gone a long time ago, but they're still independent contractors to this day. Yeah, and even on the, the real name, like, obviously, they wouldn't own it, but again, per your contract... Where, again, I was always Lance Storm uh, as far as the likeness that they had and, and could market and, and so forth. They did, I believe, maintain exclusive rights of merchandising where I couldn't sell T-shirts of my own or action figures of my own. But again, I don't know the legality of whether I would have been able to sell Lance Evers T-shirts. And I would think like um, Austin Creed isn't. That's not even his real name, is it? It's it's a different fake name that he created uh, for his Up, Up, Down, Down, I think. Uh, I could be wrong. Maybe Austin Creed is his real name, but I don't believe it is. I think his last name's different. Austin Watson. Yeah, so so Austin Creed isn't his real name. It isn't a WWE-created name. So I would think 
as long as he doesn't present himself as a WWE superstar, I would think it'd be a tough one to say you can't do that. Um, and certainly even harder to say you can't do that if you're an independent contractor. Um, I would think you should. Now, again, I know WWE has, you know, they, they don't want you to do commercials or movies or anything unless it goes through them. So maybe they're going to try to, well, obviously they are trying to put their foot down, but uh, the fact that they've let it go this long, again, does set a, I believe, a legal precedent. But again, it's do these people want to get a lawyer and fight it? Because again, WWE's got deep pockets and a good lawyer. I would imagine in 99% of the cases, it's going to be a lot easier and cheaper for you to just say, yes, sir. But that doesn't mean that's necessarily what's right. Well, I don't know what, I don't know what, I mean, that's what everyone asks. What necessity? I don't know what I don't know what happened. Okay, I do know that. I mean, if you're out there and you've got a Twitch stream and you're making X amount of money every month and they're seeing none of it, I mean, I can. I, I mean, it's Vince McMahon here. I can see him getting upset about that. Like, why? Why are you using the fame that I helped you create to be making money and I'm not seeing a cent of it? You know, there's also. And again, I don't know if there's anything to do with it, but I'm always hearing about. Oh my God, AJ said this on his stream. AJ said that on his stream. Talking about Paul Heyman and burying Paul Heyman. And then, you know, talking about how he had COVID, which they didn't want anyone talking about how they had COVID. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it. But clearly, I mean, something came to a head. And, you know, it might have been that just for a while, there were only a couple of people that had these outside things. And then, boom, all of a sudden, next thing you know, everybody's got a Twitch. Everybody's doing their TikTok thing, whatever. And maybe just flipped his lid. And as you noted... It is in the contract. It is in your contract that you're not supposed to be doing these outside things. And I don't know what allowed them to do it in the first place. Maybe they got a verbal okay. I don't know. I don't have any of the answers. I just know that people were pretty upset about it today. Well, I think, too, and it sort of relates to this show. And I just did it out of, I, I just knew it would be easier. And, and also, too, I, I thought it created a little bit of a conflict of interest. But... I was never actually told you cannot do the show on the Observer site with Brian Alvarez anymore, but I can read the room and tell that they didn't want me to. You know, they're not a big fan of yours if you're if you're, <laughs> you're unaware. So I knew doing the show with you when I went back to the I don't WB know why. Would create, well, you're the enemy. You're a dirt sheet. You're mm. just horrible. But I knew it would be, it would create tension. It would create potential problems and to be honest and it gets me in that weird position where i'm obviously gonna have to try to spin my opinions somewhat like if we discuss wwe and i'm an employee of wwe it's like it puts me in a bad spot so i just you know it's, it's just going to be easier wwe's taking me back i'll sever my ties with, with with brian and the observer site and i'll go back and exclusively work for wwe now they never said i couldn't and maybe if we just kept doing shows and i didn't say anything that would piss anybody off no one would notice long enough and i'd get away with it for a while and that may be what happened because again when i saw that talent were still selling their pro wrestling tea stuff i'm like how is that allowed and someone just told me it's like they just don't seem to notice there's so much going on that no one said anything so talent's just making money and maybe it got too much. I was curious if perhaps, and again, not to uh, studio, I'm curious if the fact that I, I know Lana occasionally makes appearances with Rusev, and maybe with Rusev gone, they don't like her uh, associating with outsiders. Who knows? Her husband. Yes, her husband. <laughs> Can't How dare associate she? with your husband if he's an outsider. <laughs> nope. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get into the rest of the stuff here because we've got a big list of topics. On the Tuesday, Brian and Vinny show, we're recapping the. Don't invasion, the WCW invasion, and this past Tuesday was in fact the day that Lance made his big return, or his big debut actually, hit the big super kick on Saturn. Sort of. Yeah, I, I, did, <laughs> I did note the camera angle where, to be fair, I believe I said it looked like you missed. Apparently you didn't miss, but what happened here, Lance? Well, not to, and, and I hate doing this, but it's something that has bothered me since it happened. If you watch it, and again, I sent you a screen cap, and I have no idea why, Perry Saturn turned away from the kick and turned his back to me and then bumped towards me. And I, I tell everyone this the first time I work with them, and if I haven't worked them in a while, because I super kick with my left foot. Most people kick with their right. And I told him I super kick with my left, 
as long as you just square up straight to me and keep your chin up, I'll just tap you. It'll be easy as, 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 as can be. And if you watch it, he stands up and he looks like he's getting ready to turn to me. So I start doing the super kick. And then he tucks his chin and turns his face away from me so that I had to try to kick over his shoulder while his chin was tucked. And I clipped him a little bit on the top of the head. And then he bumped towards me because he turned his back on me and took a back bump. And I was just like, what the hell did he do? And again, with it being, you know, such an important moment that, you know, had the crowd not pop real big and sh shat on it and s instead because it, you know, didn't really hit very well, you know, I'd have been dead. And I was really annoyed. It was just like, what the hell? It, it's, you know, just stand straight facing me and keep your chin up. You'll be fine. And he turned his back to me and tucked his chin. He did at, like the exact opposite of what I asked him to do. And thankfully, the one camera angle looked good and the crowd popped. But yeah, it's it's something that bugs me every time I see that moment in history come up because uh, it was just it was dumbfounding to me. So I'm not talking about the entire career, but in that one moment, Lance, in that one moment, was Saturn better or worse than Pat McAfee in his debut? <laughs> Pat McAfee did really well for himself. He really did. Um, it, although it was funny, and, and it, when I was watching, because again, you put it over so big, uh, you thought it was a better debut than Dominic. Um, I think I'd it go with It was different. Dom. It was very different, a completely different situation. But... I actually said it was more impressive to me. Yeah, see, where I... I, 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 I don't know if I would say that. Because again, he, he, he did a couple of big moves, but it's like, yeah, okay. You know, you either can flip or you can't to me being able to do a backflip in a match. It's like, it doesn't matter how green you are, uh, to a large extent, but he did play the crowd well. I will give him that as far as, you know, but again, he did really, really well. But I think my issue was, again, you put it over so big. And it reminded me when you talk about when, D you know, Dave will say this is match of the year or whatever. And then you watch it and you're like, it's fine, but what's the big deal? And then by the end of it, you go, oh, that's the big deal. And and I think this match was because it was constructed that way. And I, I'm not a big fan of matches constructed that way. But you put it over so big and I watch it. and I'm like, OK, they're sitting in a headlock. Why, why, why are you saying this is a great match? It's like they're not doing anything. And then again, to nitpick, because that's what I do. It's like. So the first big exciting move of the match was by the heel to get the heat. And I'm like, that's dumb. And so it was just, you know, it was, it was smoke and mirrors. But again, he carried himself so incredibly well in the heat beating up uh, Cole. And it's actually a lot harder, which again, um, Adam Cole deserves a lot of credit. It's a lot harder to carry an inexperienced worker when you're the baby face. It is so much easier the other way. So the fact that Cole had to, you know, carry things from the face side made it even harder for him. But the fact that, that McAfee had such good presence and personality, it made up for the fact that, to me, in the first at least half of the match, he looked like a very, very green rookie. Um, but even still, that's still an accomplishment because it's his first bloody match, and I don't know how much official training he had. And then when they got into the near falls, because that's really, for the most part, all there was for the match. Um, because again, the, the shine was like one high spot and then the dive, and then he just punched and kicked him for a while. But when they started getting the near falls again, they did some really good stuff and he really did fantastically well. And, and I think the thing that I appreciated the most, because so few people do this, he was the celebrity outsider coming in and he just did a straight up clean job which earns a lot of respect from me because most the outsiders, they want to come in and have the fun and go over and, you know, because they want to look strong. And it's like, well, anybody can be a Mark and come in and want to look strong. Someone who actually either understands the business enough or respects the business enough to come in and do a clean ass job and just get beat in their first match. I have even more respect for. Uh, so in that regard, I, I really uh, respected him a lot for that. But, Again, for a first match ever, phenomenal. 
And, and even just for, you know, I, again, if, if this was just, if I didn't know who he was and it was his first match, I'd be like, that was a pretty weak takeover match. But for a guy in his debut, again, it was a far more entertaining match than my debut. Although, again, you know, my debut was against someone who was also in his debut, which does make it a lot harder. You know, the thing with McAfee, everybody that I've talked to about McAfee just raves about him in the sense that he's there, he loves wrestling, he just will do anything. The old, he just shuts up and listens like... He's a he's a fan, and you know of all people, it reminds me of. of... Uh, I, I would say he's more than a fan because most fans want to come in and play the hero. Sure, but but I'm saying like he's like a real fan. He's not like he's some of these celebrities. They watch wrestling here and there. They know the names or whatever, and it's like a, a cool thing that they could. He's like a fan. He, he does not want to go in there and beat Adam Cole or whatever. Uh, the 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 announcer I was going to make of all people was Arquette when they wanted Arquette to win the the WCW title <laughs> he and he's didn't like want to. fuck I don't want this belt like I don't deserve it people are going to hate me this is ridiculous he didn't want it like well, he I, understood I, and he respected that's the he respected the wrestling business well that's and, what I've heard about McAfee and and I tweeted out that he did both himself and uh, wrestling proud uh, or something along those lines but I, I think and it's a word we don't like to use but I think the old traditional um, old school definition of it does he's not a mark where i think many of the celebrities that come in are and it's because they want to go over they want to be the hero it's like okay yeah you're marking out for yourself where mac if he wasn't a mark for himself he was a wrestling fan that understood you know obviously and was willing to be a part in wrestling and realizing that doing well and getting pinned in the middle of the ring is still a great accomplishment because he's not a mark for himself. So in, in that regard, again, I had a lot of respect for him. And again, he should be extremely proud of his performance. He was great. And his level of showmanship, because that's one of the things when you're green is even harder because you're so busy trying to remember all the damn shit you have to do to actually take your time and have some presence and some personality and stuff. He was he was really good with that. And that's where, again, in that regard, he did better than Dominic. You know, he certainly had more of the personality end of it, where I think Dominic, on the ability standpoint of actually, you know, running his spots and doing some stuff, I think Dom did a little better than he did. But again, you're getting into apples and oranges. Both guys should be uh, celebrated. And also, too, probably both guys need to uh, permanently put their opponent on their Christmas card list and <laughs> thank them for many years to come because uh, Adam Cole really helped out Adam McAfee, or um, Pat McAfee. And uh, Seth Rollins is certainly doing wonders for uh, Dominic. I think the other thing about outsiders is the outsiders that kind of only sort of know something about wrestling they know john cena they may watch it every now and then half ass they may see clips or whatever they don't really understand what's good and bad whereas a guy like mcafee i think mcafee really desperately did not want to go out and be bad whereas a lot of celebrities they don't understand good and bad it's just like you know wrestling is this wacky thing and so you know i'm gonna do what i'm told i'm gonna go out there and have fun and like not who gives a shit but I don't even think they necessarily recognize whether a segment is going to be seen as good or bad by the fans. It's just like, it's a thing. Whereas yeah. I think McAfee really desperately did not want to go out there and look bad. Yeah, because I, th I think most celebrities and probably a lot of the guest GMs and different people that they've had over the years, you know, it's just, oh, I'll go do that goofy wrestling thing. And, you know, as long as they're on offense and they get to punch somebody, they think they did Oh, great. the fans will cheer and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and, and, you know, they don't really appreciate or just understand it, because if you don't, it's just, you know, so it's that wacky wrestling thing. Uh -huh, I'll go I'll go screw around. And again, the, the people that do that, I have a real hard time with because I've dedicated my life to this job and I take it pretty damn seriously. And again, I thought uh, McAfee represented it well. Uh, just sort of a, an interesting sort of correlation to that. Um, I did, actually, there's a lot of guys that did it. Chelsea Green was in it. Uh, Harry Smith was in it. Uh, Mick Foley was in it. Uh, the movie, uh, uh, Chokeslam the Movie, a, a pro wrestling movie that was a Canadian production, and it's it's available on demand, I think, Amazon or someone. Um, but it's a really fun movie, and there's the two actors. One is uh, Michael Eklund, and I don't remember the other guy's name, unfortunately. And I think they were, you know, borderline wrestling fans. 
And I was on set the one day, and, you know, they're just in the ring screwing around, you know, doing the fake kicks and the fake punches and shit. And I pulled them aside and said, you know, I'd really appreciate if you didn't disrespect my business. It's like, you know, I'm here in your world, and I'm doing my damnedest to, you know, not embarrass wrestling and act, or sorry, acting and this film. You know, I would never disrespect what you guys do for a living because I'm not good at it. I'd appreciate it if you don't disrespect what I do. And... They like, oh, sorry, that's not what we we're doing. I'm like, I know it's not what you were doing, but it is what you were doing, whether you realized it or not. And I'd appreciate it if you didn't. And I remember afterwards, the I think it was the director uh, came to me, and it's like they were of the impression that I gave them shit, and I was I was hot about it, and they were actually scared that they might get beat up. But um, actually, the uh, Michael Eklund uh, it's just the said one, they should be. Yeah, well, actually, uh, Michael Eklund, the 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 one actor, we actually became uh, friends a little bit. I talked to him on Twitter occasionally because he he was in. Um, he still is in uh, Winona Earp, uh, which I had a uh, stunt acting gig in as well. And he was a really cool dude. And he stole the film. He's phenomenal. If you get a chance, you should watch uh, Chokeslam the movie. Uh, it's it's really good. Mick Foley's great in it. Um, Harry Smith has a very small uh, wrestling bit in it. Uh, Chelsea Green's phenomenal in it. She both stunt doubled uh, Amanda Crew as well as actually played her opponent, which is a hell of a feat. All right, so this four-way, this NXT four-way Iron Man match for the title that had no finish, or a tie, let's be fair, it was a tie, but we did not get a champion. Lance, please, for once in your life, tell me I'm right about this one. I think you're right about this one. Thank you. Finally. I, I, I think Dave's argument doesn't hold water. And it's because, and this is where, again, you know, it's a shame he's not here to defend himself, but it's, and it's it's everything in wrestling, because there's an opinion to it, but... You know, he constantly talks about how the, the new wrestling, you have to adapt, you have to grow, you can't be out of touch. You know, you're, you're out of the business for a year and all of a sudden you're out of touch. You've got to ad- adapt and learn and go on with this new wrestling. And then when you point it out that, you know, fans expect a finish and a winner and a new champion, and he's like, oh, well, they've been doing these kinds of things for years. It's like they'd always do that. That was the goal. And it's like, yeah, that's the old wrestling, Dave. That's back when... If you didn't get a result you wanted, you were mad at the heel that screwed yes. you over. Yes. You're not mad at the company for booking a shit finish. Yes. And again, I, I think that's where, and it's it's something else that I find uh, annoying. And WWE, well, everyone does it at times, but I always get annoyed when, again, it's an important match. If this was a real sport, and this was a really important match, crowning a new champion in this this four way. You would have rules in place for all contingencies. You wouldn't go, oh, crap, I never thought there'd be a tie. What do we do? There would be rules in place. And obviously, the precedent has been set with the sudden death over time. But when you were arguing with Dave, I kept thinking how, again, I don't always watch, I don't, I've never watched all the G1, but you always talk about how, well, if they end up with the same amount of points, then it's like, okay, how did each person fare against the other guy? And there's always a way of determining the winner because it's supposed to be a real sport. And I think that's where they should have. And I think you even said this. They could have and should have created a somewhat controversial finish that necessitated a rematch between two of the guys. And that's where if two, um, it was what Cole, not Cole, Jesus. Wow. Uh, Finn, ba- actually it was, it was Cole and Finn Balor, right? Yes. W- were the top two. It's like, okay, they both had two victories and were tied. It's like, okay, at that point to me, it's like, okay, which one of them got pinned more? It's like, did a couple of them have some losses or again, since Cole pinned Balor in the last fall, did Balor ever pin Cole? And it's like, there are ways you could determine who was the more dominant winning person in this match. And if you could have come up with, and again, I don't have it right now because I'd have to sit down and think, but if Finn Balor perhaps got his two wins by pinning Michael Cole, uh, Michael Cole, Jesus, that'd be an accomplishment, uh, Adam Cole, and then Adam Cole scored the last victory over Finn Balor, it's like, again, they could make the determination that since Finn Balor beat Adam Cole twice in the match and Cole only beat Finn Balor once in the match that we're awarding the win to Finn Balor. And Cole would be like, I just pinned the dude like one second ago. I should be the champ. 
<clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I should be the champion. And you could do a confrontation and you could have William Regal go, okay, this wasn't the decisive victory I wanted, but Finn Balor won. And you do have a gripe and a claim. You're getting the first shot and you're doing it next week on Super Tuesday. We're going to make sure that the right man won and you still get the rematch, but the fans actually got a close of the show with they got someone. a champion. They got a champion crowned, and I think that would have been better. Or the other way, which is, again, another classic wrestling thing, because you want, obviously, a hook for next week. Well, do a hot angle underneath this for another championship yes. and have that one main event the next show. Yes. I, I just, because, again, fans today, more than ever before, want clean, decisive finishes, and if they expect to tune in to see a new champion, they want to see it. I'm not saying that that's necessarily right, but that's just what fans want and expect now. And when you invest an entire hour to go, well, sorry, you got to come back next week again to get the finish. I understand whether you want to say it's justified or not, but you'd understand that many fans are going to be dissatisfied. And that was another thing I thought was really funny with Dave, because he said, well, you know, you, you, you'll know whether it was good or not by business going up or down. And then he conceded that business was probably going to be down. And I'm like, well, then it's probably not the best finish, is it, Dave? So, again, if they pull another great number next week, then it doesn't matter. But I do understand that you sit there for an entire hour and don't get a result that you're left leaving with a sour taste in your mouth, which, again, I don't think at this stage in the game, when everyone's trying to get their numbers to inch up rather than inch down, you want to risk anything that leaves a sour taste in their mouth. I mean, at the end regardless of the day... Of how, regardless of how hard those four guys worked. I, I've ranted about this for weeks. I mean, at the end of the day, the short end of it is, if you're going to do a tie and the champion retains, fine, that's pro wrestling. If you're going to do a draw, that's pro wrestling. When you promise a new champion and you don't deliver, that's false advertising. You fuck the people. That's it. That's There's no other way. Around. Like I said, if Adam Cole had been champion going in and it ended in a tie that necessitated another title match next week, fine. But that's yeah. not what happened. You promised that if I devote an hour of my time to this match, I'll get a new champion. And you fucked me. That's what happened. Keith yep. Lee. <laughs> Yeah, um, again, just on Raw, you know, I, I think they've done a good job with him as far as protecting him. Uh, I do agree with you that I, I, I would have preferred a more dominant uh, showing over um, Dolph. Ziggler. Ziggler. But the the one thing, and, and this is concerns me, um, is the style with which everyone loves and remembers Keith Lee for having I don't know how much of that he can do with the people he's working with. You know, like, uh, you know, um, you know, Dolph Ziggler is so much smaller than him. It's like, if I was Dolph, and again, I'm bigger than Dolph, I don't want to catch that guy. Like, I'm going to get hurt. So, you know, and uh, again, you know, I think he's, you know, he's done, you know, he he's a guy that can do the, you know, the big tilt-a-whirl head scissor and stuff. It's like, well, not with Dolph. And that's the thing with, you know, and that was, I think, one of the reasons why he constantly worked with Donovan, uh, Donovan Dijak in NXT. It's like, well, he's a really big guy that's strong and is willing to catch him and willing to and strong enough to to take some of these other moves where there's a lot of guys on the main roster that aren't. And it's like, I, I can't imagine. And again, if I was Randy Orton, I wouldn't either. It's like, I don't want to be underneath that guy when he's diving and flying and I don't think I'd be strong enough to pick him up to do a head scissor spot. So I, I think there's problems with that style that may not be just WWE doesn't want him to do it. It's just, it's hard. And, and also too, and this is where my old schoolness to me, like the, um, and I guess it was the Randy Orton match. It's like, you know, the first spot he did was, you know, the leapfrog that dropped down in the tackle. And everybody's all impressed by it, which is, again, if if, if that's what modern fans pop for, then that's great. But as an older fan, I'm thinking, if you can just run through this guy, why are you leapfrogging and drop down? And like, why don't you just run over people? Like, that's what big guys do. It's like you're the immovable force or the irresistible force and the immovable object. So there's logic issues with it, where, again, when it's, you know, someone the size of, you know, Dijak or uh, if he's in there with Lesnar, 
then those spots make sense. And that's where I always prefer matches that tell a story rather than these are the moves he does. And if he was in there with Braun Strowman or Brock Lesnar, or I'm trying to think of who else is really big, you know, even, you know, maybe even Drew, because Drew is, I think, taller than him. Then I understand the, okay, he's in there with another big truck. Holy shit, he's agile too. But when you're in there with Dolph Ziggler, I'm like, why is he using agility to win this match? Why didn't he just beat the shit out of this dude? And so there's there's issues with the style. But again, I did think it was good that he didn't lose his first match with Orton before. And he won with his finish with Ziggler. And I thought they did the right finish. Because again, unlike Dave, again, I, I when you and Dave disagree, I do tend to to be in your camp more often than not. You know, I don't think just throwing Keith Lee out of the ring and getting the pin is protecting him more than hitting him with the most protected over pushed you know, RKO out of nowhere, um, you know, he hit him with a move and took him out long enough that he could pin the other guy. And the fact that Randy thought it was a way safer bet trying to pin the guy that got hit with Keith Lee's finish five seconds ago than pinning the guy that he hit with his own right now, I think protects Lee really well. And I think it was the right finish. And I think the RKO was if the, the announcers right. would have hammered that fact home. Well, that does help. I had people explaining that to me the next day and it was like, we have three announcers on this show, and nobody pointed that out. Why do we even have announcers then? <laughs> That's their job. Well, I, I don't know if it is anymore. Well, like, it I, should I, be. It should be, yes. It's it's helping to tell the story of the match. And if you put over the fact that Randy had more confidence in pinning the guy that got hit with the... Uh, What's the what's his bomb called? The spirit bomb. The spirit bomb, rather than the RKO. It's like, well, that really tells a story and advances the Keith Lee Randy Orton story for later, especially if. And again, I have no idea if he is, but if he goes on to beat Drew McIntyre, it's like we now have you know Drew McIntyre rematches with Randy. We've got Keith Lee rematches with Randy. I don't know how far along Edge is with his tricep thing, but it's like there's a lot of things set up that we could do with Randy as a heel champion with baby faces. But even if he loses, we still have intrigue with him and Keith Lee because Randy has not managed to beat him. And we've got, you know, again, he was protected well. So I like to protect, although I do, I don't like when they, like, I, I thought the three-way should have been next week. If whichever the last match of the three was, um, would have been the Seth Rollins match, would have been the one I put on third. If after Seth Rollins beat uh, Dom, especially after he went for that second uh, stomp, that would have been a good time to send Keith Lee out as the baby face to make sure he doesn't hurt Dom anymore. He gets up in Seth's face, and you're thinking, oh, man, Keith's going to kill this dude next week. And then Randy slides in, and you, and you have that two-on-one where there's the two heels and the one big, powerful Keith Lee that's new and fresh. And the announcers are hyping that, you know, next week's main event is these three guys. You know, you could even get a little bit of physicality to close the show. I think that might have been a stronger close to the show than what we got. Well, dude, I was baffled because the next pay-per-view is September 27th, okay? The storyline they're telling is they think that Drew McIntyre is going to be back by the 27th. That sounds to me like he's not going to be there for the next three weeks. Why did we need to crown a number one contender with three weeks of television where the champion's not even going to be there? Maybe they've got something planned, but yeah, I, I agree. I, I think the uh, I think the closing shot of the three of them, maybe some physicality or just the speculation that you know Keith Lee is going to have to face both of these guys, but can Seth and Randy work together is a good hook, and build the three way for next week, and then you only got a couple weeks that hopefully by then we'll have a you know an update and maybe a promo from home from from uh drew mcintyre once randy has been declared the the uh the contender and then you've only got one week where you can have drew come back again i, I don't know the plan so maybe they you know need that extra week but i i can't help but think that uh saving it and, and also too anytime you see somebody wrestle twice on a show the second time is never as interesting so obviously the lesnar story he's gone right now 
He could be back whenever. Doubtful he's going anywhere else. They want to do Drew and Lesnar at Mania again, probably because Vince figures there's going to actually be a crowd, and we can actually get Drew his big win over Dolph in front of people this time. I guess I really, we'll see. I really wish Drew would have got that moment. That's this such poor a guy. I'm a I'm a big supporter of Drew. He's a good dude. He's great. And that really, you know, the the reaction at the Rumble, and it's like, oh man, if he could have had that at Mania with people. How would you do this with Lesnar? Well, I, again, I don't. To me, and it was it was someone else was talking about you know whether he'd be worth it to AEW and what do you do in AEW and it's like. I had this idea, and I don't know if they could make it work, but AEW has Mike Tyson right now. Tyson Lesnar has interest to me. <laughs> they could have interest and, to a lot of people. And if you had, again, I don't know if you can get Tyson or you could get Brock, but Tyson's got a thing going with Jericho. If you, either on pay-per-view or even TV, if you could do it, did Tyson Jericho on TV... And right out of the gate, TV's probably better because on pay-per-view would be a bit of a screw job. But, of course, the rest of, you know, Jericho's, you know, cronies, you know, uh, Swagger hops up, Hagar, sorry. Hagar hops up and Tyson KOs him and the proud and powerful guys go, KOs him and fucking that, you know, obnoxious Sammy takes the ref. And Brock Lesnar rolls in and spears Mike Tyson out of his boots and just destroys him and rolls out. And Jericho gets the win over Mike Tyson. And then maybe backstage afterwards or on another show, depending if you can get them, you do the face-to-face -face confrontation with like a thousand security guys trying to pull apart of Lesnar and Tyson. And you build up to Moxley and Tyson against Jericho and Brock Lesnar on pay-per-view. And you could hype up Lesnar Tyson, Lesnar Tyson. And it's like, I think they'd get a shitload of media and you could obviously have Tyson get the KO victory back on Jericho. So, you know, Tyson gets to save face and Brock didn't get beat. But if you could get Lesnar for one run in, one tag match, and then a couple of promos, I think you could build up some real big interest, Tyson Lesnar. I got to admit, that's one of your better ideas, Lance. <laughs> it's a good enough idea that it pains me that I don't think we're going to ever see it. Probably not, no. All right, speaking of AEW, Thunder Rosa's debut. I spent a whole day on Observer Live arguing with people about Thunder Rosa's debut. Yeah, it's... I think many fans, and I think many talent today, don't understand or don't want to. They're more interested in the showing that they can work and they deserve it than telling the appropriate story. And I've actually dealt with talent that when told that they you know you're going to get a big push we want you to squash some people we're going to give you a big you know the goldberg run for lack of a different description and they don't want it because they want to show that they can work and they want to have five star matches and i'm always just dumbfounded it's like but you got to get over first and you you talked about it and it's just there's right place right time it's like i Again, I'm all for Serena Deeb and Thunder Rosa having a 10-minute match on television. That's great. But like you say, it's like this is the only chance this woman has to look impressive before she challenges Sheeta for the title. It needed to be a strong, strong outing. And if you don't want to squash Deeb, then find someone else. And let, you know, Serena Deeb have a, a good 10-minute match on Dark that she wins and gets some credibility and you build up to her having a match with someone else at another time. But I think too many people, both fans and wrestlers, um, worry more about, you know, the, you know, oh, they deserve to have time, they deserve to have a good match, where sometimes somebody just has to take a bullet. And again, this is coming from a guy that more often than not was the guy that took the bullet. That, you know, there's a time. And, and the fallacy of you know uh squash matches and stuff don't get over anymore and you you mentioned many instances again you know goldberg being one but that again to to use my own argument against me that's the past do you remember and you will once i remember remind you of it how over baron corbin was when baron in corbin NXT, was in nxt when he was squashing people and the crowd would count off the seconds of how long it would take to beat people. 
He was so over. Fans loved him. They would do the count. They would pop huge for him. And guess and when he stopped getting over? As soon as the match as went longer. As soon as they, it went long. As soon as they couldn't count that high, they got tired. Dude, there was another one I didn't mention today on the show because people were saying, well, give me an example of when this... Dude, Ryback. Ryback yes. of all people. That guy was undefeated and he mauled everybody. And they built up to him and CM Punk for the title in Hell in a Cell, and that was the best drawing show that they did in that era, in whatever short era that was. That worked, because you had an undefeated guy against the longest reigning champion, or whatever the records were at the time, but that, with Ryback of all people, that worked. Well, storytelling still works, and and that's, that's really the crux of it. The fans that wanted the longer match with, with Rose and Deeb were, again, well, we want to show their work rate. We want to show people that the women can have long matches on TV rather than telling the appropriate story at that time. And again, I'm all for good long women's matches on TV as well. But again, the go-home show of the pay-per-view with the challenger that we've never seen before, I agree it needs to be dominant and that's just the way it is and again i'm one of the guys that have been pulled aside like look sorry dude you got to take the bullet here we're trying to get this guy over and it's like okay and that's and your job that's that's the job that's the why time. you're called a jobber sometimes you're doing the <laughs> Thanks, job here that's your fucking job no man, it's you not, mean, not sorry, you in particular but yeah. like there's a reason that's the, the term is. you're yes. doing a job for somebody that's your yep. job it is and it was mine more often than not in a lot in a lot of but it, but it's just it, it is what it is and i again i think that is the time for it and if your goal is to showcase high quality women's matches well i'm hoping thunder rose and Sheeta will do that at the pay-per-view and again if let's assume Sheeta retains i would think you know that would be a good time for you know after that match to you know, for the sake of throwing Billy Corgan a bone and having uh, Thunder Rosa then come on and have the good competitive match with Serena Deeb and pick up another win and remind people that she's actually really good and, and send everybody home happy. But I, I, I'm in your camp that, you know, sometimes it's more about the story and where you're going than the five-star match. Well, dude, listen, like if Thunder Rosa, if they want to get her for one more date and on Wednesday she can go in there and she's not going to beat Hikaru Shida, but... She can beat a former AEW Women's Champion, whoever they want to to throw out there that, that's held the title in the past. Go ever go out there. She beats a former AEW Women's Champion in her final appearance or whatever. And they got something, and and NWA got something for loaning her there to do a job for their champion. And you can have your long twelve minute match back and forth, boom, 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 whatever you want, when the time is right. It's timing, Lance. You know this. Yes. Timing. Exactly. Now speaking of timing, we're almost out of it. But I do want to talk, should, and, and granted, I mean, we've heard both arguments, we've heard everyone's argument about for and against, but what do you think, Lance? Should NXT move Knights? Uh, should is a different one, um, because obviously I, 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 my question is where, again, I understand why WWE wants it to be where it is. And if it's WWE's decision, then I think it should stay head to head because if Vince is the one making that decision. Now, again, there is another side to that, too, which you mentioned. And I thought about one. Oh, yeah, I could see that. I think there's a bigger upside to it moving to Tuesday. I think it ranking higher in the demos and pulling bigger numbers on Tuesday makes the company look good. I think being Tuesday right after Raw gives you the ability to promote it more on Monday and make it succeed better. And I think the big thing that you pointed out, which I think it makes Triple H look better. Yes. Because he will have a more successful product standing on its own and seem to be succeeding at a greater, uh, even if he's putting on the exact same show and it has nothing to do with whether he's doing better or doing worse, the perception if being on his own gets him up to 800, 900,000 viewers, um, 
then and especially if it pulls better demos because AEW is not pulling away, you know, some of the younger demos on him. I think it gives you a means by which to spin him as an even bigger success, which I think will bode long term well for them. But again, the only thing where I can see that if it is in fact damaging AEW, I could see where WWE want to keep it there because when TV rights contracts come up, still looking like you are head and shoulders above anyone else puts you in a good bargaining position for better TV money. But that's where I disagreed with Dave, where to me, USA, if AEW is another worthwhile wrestling commodity, if there's three networks bidding that they want wrestling and there's two companies, you're not going to have to pay as much than if there's three networks that want wrestling and there's only one company. And USA might have to, if USA succeeds in damaging AEW, a USA may succeed in making themselves pay more money next time the TV contract comes out. So as a fan, I would love to see the moves to Tuesday. From a TV standpoint, I could see it being a good sell to move them to Tuesday. It's just whether I think Vince has the confidence of keeping Raw and SmackDown ahead of AEW. And well, the two that- the two big things, especially that last one right there, we have now seen what AEW and what NXT do when they're unopposed. And it's not like AEW did 1.5 million viewers this week or 2 million viewers. They did like 925 or whatever. And there have been many weeks where they've done 825, 850. So NXT is sacrificing all of this for 100,000 viewers off of AEW. 100,000 viewers? And the, the key with Triple H is, you know, as we talked about a million times, there's some of these investors that kind of have a clue, but most of them have no clue whatsoever, okay? So this stock market is going to live and die at a lot of things, and... The WWE stock price, there's going to be a day where Vince is not there. And his successor is Triple H. And so you are willing to prevent 100,000 people every week from watching AEW. But in doing so, you're telling the world that the successor to Vince McMahon can't even get in the top 50 on average about once a month. Whereas if you move them to Tuesday, they will almost surely regularly be in the top 10 or the top 15. The guy will look like, oh, well, you know, Vince is gone, but at least this guy, I mean, he's, he's in the top 15 every week. Instead, what they're going to see is this is a show that, you know, it, it, it's number 30, number 35. Sometimes it's not even top 50 getting killed by this other show. That's the perception that you're willing to put out to institutional investors or whoever for the sake of... Of 100,000 viewers that you're taking away from AEW, this is madness to me. Especially when you consider that that 100,000 are probably in the plus threes or plus sevens anyway. Sure. Like, if you're actually making a big dent in AEW, fine. But as we have now seen, you're not. You're barely making a difference. And if you were on Tuesday and not in that position of terrified and again this is where I, I hated the monday night wars for this when you're so terrified of the channel switching over you often sacrifice quality for the moment and i think if nxt was on tuesday i think triple h could do more of the show he was doing before they went uh live on the usa network which generally most fans liked better because you weren't in that constant pressure of having every segment must hold and i think you could you know you could make your stories better you wouldn't have the out of the blue title for title match and stuff so i I think hunter could do a better show if he was on tuesday i think the results and the numbers would be much better if they were on tuesday and as a fan it would be much nicer yeah monday night wars when when nitro and raw went head to head if nitro was pre actually was usually if raw was preempted if raw was preempted dog show whatever Nitro saw huge growth. But with this Wednesday Night War, when AEW goes head-to-head with NXT, they have had the occasional quarter that was right around 1 million. And this week, with no competition, they had quarters right around 1 million. So 
This is a lot of sacrifice for nothing. It's it's almost literally nothing. But anyway, Lance, let's get your no plugs in. Hey, I've got, again, I think there's one or two more days on the Labor Day sale at ProWrestlingTees.com. So you Lance. can still have a store here, Lance? I could, in, in, I don't have a contract with you that says that you own my name and all my merchandise. You haven't it, read so. it closely enough. <laughs> I haven't signed anything. But yeah, uh, SWA and Lance Storm uh, tees are available there. And again, if you don't want to buy my stuff, buy something of anybody that's out there, you know, trying to make the few bookings that are available uh, anybody out there, you want to support a wrestler and buy a shirt, go nuts, even if it's not mine, at Lance Storm on Twitter. And I should have some, hopefully in the next week or two, some more climbing mountain, hiking through the uh, the mountains photos to post on uh, Storm at Storm Wrestling Academy on Instagram, as well as my Twitter, because I'm hoping to get out and do another big hike here in the next week or so. Well, that Lance Storm on Twitter is the easiest. I'm at Brian Alvarez. Obviously, check out WrestlingObserver.com, as we noted, and Video.F4WOnline.com for all of your video needs. And that's it, everybody. We are out of here. We'll talk to you again after a while. Adios. Boom.